It's Deadpool month, everybody. We're doing it. I hoped we had a better name for it. It's Merc with a Mouth month. Merc with a Mouth month. Is That's that too the many one. M's? No, it's perfectly alliterative. I feel like if we say it too many times, it's going to be like, it's Merc with a Mouth month. No, it's Merc. No, you've said it now, Ryan. It's yeah. canon. It's Merc with a Mouth month. Yeah, but I'm, it's dangerously close to becoming it's Merc with a Mouth month. It's Merc with a Mouth month. <laughs> All right, cue the music. Hello and welcome back to the Comic Lyric Podcast, the podcast where I, Ryan, also soon to be known as Comic Stan, get my real book stand of a bloke, uh, friend and co-host to make it basically make him read comics and then force him to talk about them. It's kind of like his purgatory hell. What he's done to deserve it? Don't ask. And with me, as always, is my aforementioned mercenary co-host, it's Jamie. Your intro is becoming more and more jazz-like every time. I like to think of it more as unhinged. It's getting as, a bit unhinged. As we slowly get more unhinged hosting this podcast. I mean, I'm only going to get more unhinged coming in the in the coming weeks, Ryan. Can you get more unhinged? Like that's a <sighs> it's real. It's coming, babe. It's that, coming. That's a real. Uh, can God make a boulder so big that He Himself or they cannot push it? There have been some pretty distinct th- factors in my life that have made me be a little bit less unhinged recently that are no longer a factor. So yeah, I'm probably going to get more unhinged. Yeah. Well. Tune in every week, make sure you don't miss it, and especially there's no better time to get unhinged than us talking about the Merc with the Mouth, the aforementioned Deadpool, for you an like entire month. Today. Uh, it's in the it's because it's in the intro. It fits within mm. the intro, so then it's fresh in the mind. It's like you you said before about like you try and use a word several times to try and get it in the vocabulary. Like that's I think people do that accidentally. I did that as a teenager. That, that's a weird thing to do as a teenager. I was a weird teenager. You're a weird adult still. And that's why I we... don't know if I'm a weird adult, Ryan. What are you wearing right now? I am wearing tell short me what, socks. Tell me what you're wearing. <laughs> do, do you, right, I'm wearing short socks. Mm, normal. I'm wearing blue shorts. I'm wearing a Sonic the Hedgehog t shirt. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's seen better days, but I enjoy that about it. I'm wearing a chain, a watch. It was mainly the Sonic uh, t shirt. Right, that that's what you were driving towards. <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with the Sonic tea? tea? I'm just saying that it's, while well, very appropriate for a podcast, like a comic book podcast, that's, you know, not far off at all. Sonic even had comics, I do believe. But if we're comparing ourselves to, like, the normies of the world, like, I think we both stand out. Yeah, maybe. I would love to read a Sonic comic, just so I can call it a Sonic comic. Well, Sonic 3 is going to come out at some point, so, you know, we have a the reason to do it. The movie or the game? 3. The games are well past 3. The games are well, like- yeah, I know, but there might have been, like, some next-gen console reboot that I'm not familiar with, because I'm not really a gamer. Yeah, they sometimes do weird numberings of uh, games, don't they? Um, but yes, so, Merc with a Mouth Month, uh, because mm. leading up to Deadpool 3, which we're both very excited for- It's going to be great. Maybe me more so, because Deadpool has been like my one of my favourite characters. At one point, he was my favourite character. To the point where, comic we're actually talking about today, as you've seen from the title, is actually his first ongoing series back in 1997. Really? His first one? First one. He had some limited series before that, mm. um, but this was his first one, and they were like, alright, we'll give you an ongoing series. Cool. And it's actually, I think, the first proper like trade paperback that I read as a kid. Oh. I I had read comics like here and there, like very mm. loosely. I got into the Deadpool character, um, literally because at that time his some of his panels and like quotes and stuff were being shared like memes. Oh, like, uh, okay. He was doing meme worthy stuff. Mm. Not from this comic, come later on. Yeah. And we'll get into that. I'll go into a, a brief history of kind of where we're touching in on. But I started this one and this was I I remembered this being better than I think I as read it now yeah basically i was reading this one and i went this is quite similar to the first one i read not thinking it was different because i uh... thought the one i had read was better and then it got to issue two and i went oh no this is the same so one. when did you first read this like years and years ago i can't remember the exact year but it was the first kind of big comic that i read mm. i think i read it on Comicsology back in the day because i was just literally like like where can i find deadpool comics and that was like the easiest way to just get any comic and it was also yeah. like a i don't know if it's even still going now Comicsology, um but it's it's it was a weird kind of it was a software back in the day where like you bought it and then it had like a reading kind of like a kindle kind of software like where you could read through the is pages this like the that. one where they because comics have their own special image format don't they so they load really quickly in high yes. definition dot cbr i think is it's that called? where that was developed i think so well i no idea maybe maybe not but mm. yeah it's a unique thing anyway but main point was 
I thought this, I remembered this being a better comic than it was. <laughs> I still got good things to say about it. And I think it's very yeah. interesting looking at the character. This is the first time we're giving a character a whole month, like examination. Yeah, this is wild, isn't mm. it? And I've lined up the comics we're going to be doing. There's a loose kind of relation to the films as will be going yeah. on. So I think that's going to be an interesting factor cool. of it. But yeah, so first ongoing series, 1997. And I have the credits. Uh, so written by, or story by Joe Kelly with pencils by Ed McGuinness and inks by uh, Nathan Massengill uh, with Norman Lee. So I think that's the general stuff going forward. We're going mm. for issues one to six because, oh no, even worse, one to five, was it? One to five. One to five, because that's the first kind of arc. Uh, with a little touch on issue minus one. Um, <laughs> that we'll get to in the arting. So again, Deadpool started, he, well, as I said, this was his first ongoing series, but he was created a few years beforehand. He was created by a uh, comic writer and artist, uh, Rob Liefeld. This is the guy who's largely panned for his terrible art, isn't he? He's the, he's the Captain America guy with the weird torso. Yeah, I wouldn't say he's panned for his art generally he's panned for that specifically bad art yeah and that was a cover wasn't it i don't even think so maybe let's have a look because I, I don't even remember if it was a cover or just like a page within it uh i remember when i was doing our tiktoks and i was talking about bad comic book art that was the piece of art that always came up when i was hunting for that stuff yeah i don't think that was a it's a it's a lone image but i don't know if it's a cover or not what i do think is funny is that he captain america um the sam wilson character who was falcon who became captain america yeah he had a front cover he had a cover issue of that style like as homage <laughs> to that one i think it's a really fun thing it's like yeah pay you pay respects to the good stuff that came before but like pay respect to the really bad stuff is like where the fun starts that's, you know? that's a fantastic idea and i love it i've got on my computer i don't want to turn around but if you can lean over you can see it just here that's incredible and i love it yeah i think rob liefeld appreciated as well now, the thing about deadpool is rob liefeld constantly credits himself uh with creating the character did he not he did, but he created the character with an artist by the name of Fabian. I'm going to mispronounce this surname, so Would you I like me to do have a look and try. You can take a crack. Fabian Fabian Nishieza. Fantastic. Well done. So what happened was uh, Rob Liefeld was the writer and Fabian was the artist, and they do they do credit as being the like, co-creating the character, even though Rob Liefeld does constantly say, "I create, I'm the guy who created Deadpool." So it's interesting that he now says it differently. But yeah. the thing, the funny thing about it is, Deadpool is such an obvious ripoff of an existing DC character called Deathstroke. Yes, with a bit of Spider-Man thrown in as well, I think, in the way he looks. Yeah, exactly. And Liefeld does literally say, um, he said uh, he was a fan of Wolverine and Spider-Man, and he was a fan of the Teen Titans comic at the time that introduced right. Deathstroke. So apparently he then made a character, showed it to um, Fabian, who actually was also a writer. Um, I think they're co- maybe co-writers who created a yeah. created Deadpool. But it says, upon seeing the costume and noting the characteristics, uh, a killer with super legit agility fabian contacted liefeld saying this is deathstroke from teen titans <laughs> and whether how liefeld reacted to that or not we don't know but what we do know is that fabian named De like he was already named deadpool fabian gave him the um secret identity name of wade wilson right. based on deathstroke's real name slade wilson oh my god i didn't realize it was that close yeah it, well this is the thing i, I always assumed the liefeld was taking the piss when he named the, the character so close well, they just sort of marvelized it didn't they they just made it they just took slade wilson and made it alliterate did dc not get pissy about this one i think they were doing it to each other so often because right. when you look at all the cross like the similar characters like hawkeye green arrow yeah aquaman and namor uh like so loads this, others so at the time this was just part of the culture was this the 80s or the 90s this was 90s this, so Peak deadpool 90s. was in the 90s yeah he was created in the 90s um which, 1991 actually which is relatively modern if you think about it even even characters who came to popularity in the 90s and 2000s they were largely either new characters in existing franchises like the second sort of wave of the x-men mm. or they were existing characters who they gave new monikers to so like dick grayson went from being robin to being nightwing nightwing, yes. nightwing. 
Whereas this is a whole new character, fresh for the shiny cocaine 90s, isn't it? Yes. It, although he was introduced as like a side character in the New Mutants originally, which like, well, I thought was yeah, lying at the time. Yeah, because he's really like closely related with the X-Men, isn't it? Yes, yeah. So he's introduced in the New Mutants, and he was literally just a bit of a lippy mercenary. Yeah. Like, that was it. And then he kind of slowly, he, he appeared in other stuff and he slowly started developing a bit more personality. And the reason that we're doing 97, the first one, not only just because it's the first ongoing series, but a lot of people credit this and Joe Kelly, the writer, with kind of finding the pers- the, the defining personality of, of Deadpool. And it got way more unhinged in the 2000s, didn't it? Yes. So what problem was, what happened was later on, he got more popular as a character what, and at the time when I got into him, so I got into him, and then I I had this misconception as a comic book fan, a new comic book fan yeah. at the time, and I think a lot of people do. I was interested in this character, and I mistakenly thought I should probably read from the start. Right. And thank God that it was a character who was created in the nineties. Yeah, because one of the things you learn as a comic book fan is that once you find an era or a character you're into. Th- going back doesn't necessarily mean you're going to find a treasure trove of that kind of content it's not even that it was like i'll find good stuff or not i just it i because i was so um amateur new to the whole thing i looked at like as if it was like a tv or a book series right start from the beginning because that's if you got into a character in a book series you'd be like if if you got into play harry potter you wouldn't just go middle of the series you'd go oh i should start with philosopher's stone and work up that way so in that same vein sorcerer's stone for our american yes, listeners for the, for the aluminium people <laughs> um but yeah it's I, aluminum aluminum the land of aluminum i was trying to think of the other one i can i just yeah, the land of alun- aluminum and tiki tack yes and really questionable presidential debates from what i've been seeing on the news recently yeah so one of the few times made me feel good about british politics <laughs> very that rare, takes very a lot rare. doesn't yeah. it so yeah, I mistakenly thought I should read from the start, and I did start with this one. Luckily, I didn't even have to start with the limited series or what have you. But yeah, read the read through this, kept going, and then by the time I got to the time period that I was at, what I realized was, and has been backed up by the brief research I did today, is that once Deadpool became more well-known and famous because of the memes, he was then written to be more of a jokey, even more of a jokey yeah. character. And a lot of people were like, Oh no, you've you've made it worse now. And by the time you get into the twenty tens when the Deadpool films start coming out? Is it the twenty tens? Twenty sixteen was the first one. Twenty sixteen, yeah. so like deep into the twenty tens. God, post Brexit nearly. Yeah. Um Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool is very quippy and very funny. Yes, but And he was a bit more grounded here. I I, I wasn't yeah. expecting so the only Deadpool I'd read coming into this was the one where he fights not all the other Marvel characters, but all the fictional characters from literature. So that's an interesting one. That was a, I almost considered us doing that, yeah. but it's a quite commonly done one is Deadpool kills the Marvel universe. Yeah. And then after that, that same Deadpool breaks out of his universe yeah. and starts going through all literary and eventually tries to break through to like the real world. Yeah. So what they do is they have to get then 616 Deadpool because that's a side, that's a alt world alternate yeah, universe yeah, yeah. one. They get six one six Deadpool. Be like, look, one of your others is like going batshit and actually might kill the writers. And Deadpool's like, oh, not the writers. Uh, I, guess, <laughs> uh, I guess I'll help. But um, yeah, so we almost did that one potentially. And there was only a little bit of that fourth wall breaky stuff here. Mm. Should we starting with the arting? Yeah, we can starting with the arting. We're starting, starting with, with the arting, arting. We're and we're gonna, gonna talk about, about art. art. So the art. The arting. The thing, the arting. The thing that really struck me about this is that it could have been published this week. It's interesting that it could, because it's it's very different. And the way it looks, it hmm. looks like a modern Marvel comic. It doesn't look like a 90s Marvel comic, does it? No, I think the one thing that's different about comparing it to Monday is the proportions on the more muscled characters. Yeah. I think they look a bit ridiculous. Less so the antagonist, because or one of the antagonists, but yeah, Deadpool at sub points looks just like looks like the Hulk. He he is quite hulking, and the way that they drew the Hulk, you can see that it's more of a nineties Hulk than a modern Hulk. Yes, definitely. Because the Hulk turns up, doesn't he? Yeah, he's in it for a bit. Also, we're we're, we're going full in spoilers because it's from ninety seven. So yeah, if you've not on. read it yet, it's, and it's and your own fault. This Deadpool series actually ran. Guess what number this Deadpool series ran till ninety seven? No, no, what uh, issue number? Yeah, ninety seven is my guess. Nope. What where's your number did it run to? Think of a funny number. Sixty nine. Sixty nine. Did it actually? It actually did. That's I don't know if that was so intentional, funny. but I saw that today. I was like, "That's that's fun." 
because um, it's the sex number. Anyway. So uh, this ran for almost seven years. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, yeah, well into, yeah, 2004. And then it was replaced with another series, which uh, a series of a different character, bloody Agent X. It's a whole thing. Let's not get into that right now. If you want to look up, look up Agent X. It's wild. Um, but yeah, the art, I sent you a few screenshots of another issue i read yes um which was so i i said let's do issues one to six it's the first arc of the series and then that's kind of a no what bloody hell issues one to five it's normally six isn't it yeah it is normally six issues one to five it's the first arc and then i had a look at issue minus one because i was like what is this mm. and it turns out it's the same writer different artist and i was so surprised because issue minus one it's a whole building up to the backstory of like what will be the big story going forward but it looks really 90s doesn't it yeah it looks quintessential 90s so if you think about i the best advice the best example i gave to you earlier um in the rare moments we talked outside the podcast which we don't well, ever ex no exactly which was quintessential 90s um art for me is batman getting his back broken by bane and yeah. being replaced by azrael batman who was the gritty 90s batman they were trying to the writers were trying to get across to be like look batman's even darker and cooler and oh you don't like yeah. it oh no batman's back he's fine his back's fixed now and that and and the thing is they were trying to make him darker and cooler but what they did is just covered him in color and weird armor this is you know just going back to that joke about us not talking outside the podcast i listened to the hello internet podcast for a long time and Brady said to Gray on that at one point that there are times when he wants to show Gray something or he wants to talk to him about it because they're like buds outside the podcast, I suppose. Like we are. Um, well. Well. <laughs> cheers, bud. I really need you right now. Um, and um, he's like, oh, I won't talk about that because I'll save it for the podcast. And yeah. I do sometimes do that with you. Yeah. Like if there's something that I want to talk Don't to you about. waste content. Yeah, this is it. If there's something that's going on, I'll be like, well, I'll save that because that'll be a fun tangent for the podcast. Exactly. And it means that a lot of our conversations outside of the podcast are now about the podcast. Yeah. How ways to make the podcast better naturally. Yeah. We, we you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be in, we'll be like in a place on a Friday night when we the rare occasion that we get to do that mm. and we'll be talking and the conversation will almost always go around to the podcast to the extent that we were sat with one of our friends the other day and ended up having a one hour conversation about the podcast that he's not even on yep yep <laughs> and to be fair we are young successful entrepreneurs so we do need that extra <laughs> talking well we're, i think we're one of those three at least yeah yeah guess which one at home um so yeah the art going back to the art the art was very weird when you first see it although i got used to it quite quickly i thought it was great i thought it was it felt unusual but it did really fit with the content especially i thought it was the way ahead of its time that's the thing to me it looked so fresh and so clean mm. so fresh and, and so, so clean clean, clean. Um, it looked so fresh and so cleanly cleanly drawn that it didn't have any of those sort of niggles that I tend to have with older comic book art. Mm. The issues, the issues, what, zero was it? Or minus one. I issue think, minus yeah. one looked good still, mm. but it had that, yeah, it had Quintessential that. Quintessential 90s. It reminded me of that X-Men comic we read recently. Yes, which was late 80s, so very yeah. similar. Yeah. yeah, I mean, similar era, yes. really, isn't it? I feel like 90s comics kind of had the a lot of the vibe of 80s comics. Yeah, I mean, they were, again, they were just getting darker and grittier yeah. from, from the 80s. So, yeah, absolutely. The color scheme was very vibrant, colorful, which, again, suits the character. Actually, yeah. But also got dark and muted at the right points. Like yeah. when they go to this um, mercenary hangout, which is an, yeah. a, a closed down orphanage or something. Obviously, quite dark and dank. They, there. Call, it the, they call it the, the hell something? Hell, uh, hell lounge or something. Hell something yeah i can't remember now but it's the hell something we read this book very closely yeah and also it it's it doesn't matter <laughs> it yeah. doesn't matter what it's called um yeah vibrant colors when it was outside and needed and obviously deadpool being a big red character is obviously going to be quite bright and vibrant and everything and i think of red ball as bit deadpool as being <laughs> like a sleeker comic book character he's normally he's, yeah he's more he has more of the build of like a spider-man and less of the build of like yeah. a wolverine but here he has like wolverine and hulk's build but i think this is the problem with this era is if you're a character like if you if you're a superhero character regardless of powers or not you're just muscled and hulk they they want you to have superman's proportions don't they yes but then the female characters were more correctly proportioned like yeah siren and blind owl i have so many issues with siren <laughs> 
Fair enough. I have so many issues with Siren. With the art or the character? The character. Right, so we'll get it. onto it, but we'll save it for the, the moment you mentioned her, I was like just chomping at the bit to talk about my issues with Siren. Yeah. Would you call, I thought this, would you agree this is more cartoony style? If you look um, like the character's faces and stuff. No. Really? No. Because this is reminding me of kind of 90s cartoons. But more, <sighs> more exaggerated proportions. The thing is, though... 90s comic book cartoons didn't have the look of cartoons in the 90s. They had the look of 90s comic books. And this kind of reminded me a bit of like Batman animated series, but like a harsher, like a more sharper lined, and again, fucked proportions. Uh, yeah, I don't. So this didn't really put me in mind of like 90s comic book cartoons. This looked, for me, this looked about as realistic and gritty as I want a comic, as I want like a big two Western comic to look. Right. This kind of this this did this for me really hit the spot in terms of the artwork. I really enjoyed it. I was surprised. I'm surprised by how much you enjoy the artwork. Not as a anything to the artwork itself. I was in. I, I was interested to hear what your thoughts were going to be on like the proportions and stuff. Because I know you've said before your main issue with things like this is inconsistent styles. Yes, but this was very congruent. Mm. This was really consistent, and Deadpool was consistently hulking. I think there were some parts where he seemed a bit more normal and then other parts, like when he's kind of moving and fighting, I think mm. he was a bit thinner. When he was then stationary, that's when he seemed to be bigger and more muscled. Yeah, potentially. Like, I didn't notice it though. That might be like a drawing people in motion as opposed to standing or sitting. Yeah. Like, One of the things that I did really notice about the way that Deadpool was drawn in this is that they hadn't really nailed how they were going to display his skin yet when he was just weighed. Yeah. He looks like the thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it's really... Like lines. Yeah, well, it's it's like the way that they've textured it. His skin looks more like stone than scorched skin, if that makes yeah. sense. Like, the way that he... In more modern interpretations that I've seen, there's this, like, redness and, like, rawness to his skin. Yeah, it, in later issues, there's more of a common... There's more of a consistency that it looks like sores. Like, there's a yeah. bit of red amongst the, the grey skin colour. And that's absolutely what they were going for in the first film, isn't it? Hundred oh, percent, yeah. But here, he kind of, like... He almost looks like he's been petrified. Yeah, looks like stone. I guess maybe kind of like maybe it's like a, a very dry skin kind of look. Yeah, maybe. this is it. Maybe that's what they're going for. And 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 that to me was interesting because it was quite jarring. Again, not ha not having read a lot of Deadpool, I still had some preconceptions going into this because I've read some. Yes, and obviously I'm familiar with the films and you know the Ryan Reynolds portrayal, which is just beautiful. Yeah, like the way that Ryan Reynolds portrays Deadpool is fantastic. But we'll get he, on to he that. Was, and he was made for it. Yeah, he was. He was. Like, he was the perfect actor. Mm. Per you know, it's one of those instances where Marvel really nailed the casting. What's interesting about that is, and I read this in my research today, and I knew this as well, I just had it reconfirmed. You know when you think you know a thing, mm. and then you see it confirmed, you're like, I was right about that. What it was, was uh, there was a Deadpool comic where Deadpool's complaining about how he looks, which used to be a real part of his character and now it's not anymore like back in the day he wouldn't let the reason he lives with blind owl we'll get to this in i mean have we done with the art yeah we can be done with the art i will say i liked how expressive he was with his mask on i yeah. like that that was a good kind of art and that's that's one of the things that i really got from the deadpool films is that with a lot of comic book characters who wear masks you can't really see their human expressions through the masks mm. But with Deadpool's, the way they did it, it kind of spread over his mouth so you could see his mouth working. And they really nailed that in and the comic book somehow. The eyes, I think, were a big part as well. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I think Deadpool for me is probably one of my favorite super suits. Mm. Like, I think, I think. I mean, if you like Spider-Man, you like Deadpool. Well, and it's super close to Spider-Man, but it's a really nice refinement thereof. Although in later iterations, he had that little like nipply bit on his head. Yeah. Didn't he? Which I also like. Liked, material. Which I also liked because it really gave the sense that it was like a hastily thrown together suit mm. not a million billion dollar one from tony stark yeah um and you know early iterations of spider-man he has this really clean suit and you're like how did peter parker make that in a fucking bedroom in brooklyn mm. <laughs> you know unless he's a fantastic seamstress i think there i've read a spider-man comic where there's a joke about that where he's like oh i'm gonna have to fix my suit and someone's like oh i didn't know you knew how to sew stuff and he was like i had to learn yeah like <laughs> and i can see that i can see yeah. him a smart kid like him being like i'm just gonna learn how to become a seamstress yeah, or a tailor, I suppose, yes. if you want to gender it. But um, I literally didn't even realize till you've just pointed out the seamstress is gendered. Yeah. I've always just thought it's just a neutral, like, someone who seems. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no. uh, there, there, should, there should be a non-gender neutral term for it, I think. But um, yeah, no, it's, in, it's interesting that he was that expressive, wasn't it? Yeah. 
And yeah, I, lo- I love the way all the characters looked. I really like, what's her name? Siren? Siren, yeah. I can't remember uh, her real name. I liked, I liked her character design. I liked that she wasn't hypersexualized. Hmm. She um, looked like a very typical mutant character. Like yeah. they all have a similar kind of look. And I suppose this really did put me in mind of like X-Men art styles, you know? Yes. It, and, well, and, uh, Rob Liefeld was one of the big contributors to the 90s X-Men look. Oh, After right. Chris Claremont, I think was the right type. Don't know if Tom had who the artist is. Might have been Chris Claremont as well, but Rob Liefeld being a writer and uh, artist, I yeah. think he contributed a lot to that as well. For, right, because like, yeah, because it was really close. And obviously Deadpool is kind of, I mean, in certainly in like his character Inception, he's a spinoff from the X-Men universe. Isn't yes. he? He's an artificial mutant. He is li- one of the biggest like side characters to the X-Men, if that makes sense. Yes. And it's, and, and you know, he's turned up in the cinematic universe a little bit, hasn't he? Or at least Wade has. So, what, in the X-Men films? Yeah. So he's not been in an X-Men film. But... Wade Wilson was there, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. X-Men Origins, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah that one. Um, what I always think As of... Ryan Reynolds as yeah, well. Yeah. Like, Ryan Reynolds as Wade Wilson before Deadpool. Well, so that's when he first cast, because the point I was going to make earlier was, there's a Deadpool comic where he's complaining about how he looks, and we'll get into that in a bit, but he describes himself as Ryan Reynolds mixed with a sharp A. And... <laughs> That's so good. I think apparently what happened was it got to Ryan Reynolds because at the time he was not a famous actor. He'd yeah. been in things. I think it, at that time he was most famous for a couple of things after Two Girls, that was a Two Guys, a Girl in a Pizza Place. I've uh, never heard of it. That was like the show that kind of first brought him any kind of fame. Right. And then he did like Was this in after. Canada as well? Was this Canadian? Something? I don't think it was Canadian. Although Nathan Fillion was in it as well. We like Nathan Fillion. He's, he's great. Um, so it got to Ryan Reynolds and then he saw this and then got into the character. Like he just literally, he got this comic because he was mentioning it. He was like, oh, that's cool. And he was like, who is this guy? And then, Reynolds, <laughs> and then Ryan Reynolds got to play. was like, I'm this character. Like I can play this character. He's Canadian. I'm Canadian. Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that led to him pushing for and getting cast in X-Men Origins. Right. Okay. That's really cool. Yeah. So yeah. So, you know, he's been a sort of ancillary character in the, in the X-Men universe for a long time. Yeah. Well, since the nineties, since the X-Men universe was huge. Cause it wasn't that big until the 90s was it i think 80s were pretty big 80s had you had your big your big players and all their side characters yeah um so in terms of this story Mm. what are we thinking about it i thought the story was quite generic for the first two issues and then the third issue was when i went oh this is the real stuff like yeah here's where i was genuinely getting a bit bored with the first two issues yeah me too and then issue three i was like here we go and the biggest note was for me was uh, in the first two issues he was so he was quite overly quippy and i generally thought i don't remember him being this quippy this early on like i remember him being a bit more substantive and a bit deeper yeah and and not that he can't be quippy at all but it had a meaning and then issue three there's a moment in issue three where he stops quipping and stops joking right and i went oh that's where it is that's what i remember and the problem was i just didn't remember where it specifically happened Mm. but that's the point where and it's basically he's confronted with i mean the general story of deadpool this deadpool arc it's the first two issues are him just doing his normal mercenary stuff there's a background um plot of him tr- being possibly recruited by people who want him to save the world for some reason okay and he's like nah i'm not a hero and there was actually one of the either writer or artists who worked on one of his limited series before this ongoing series they literally said if i had known um how bad how evil of a character deadpool was because he was just a mercenary for hire yeah he was like i would not have done a series where he was the main character really he literally said like he's done too much bad for him to be a main character and i think this was before like any villains had their own series yeah like if you had your own series you were uh, you were becoming a hero or at and least I an suppose anti-hero. gritty batman was as close as we got to anti-hero wasn't it well, uh, Batman's the archetype hero. Like, I don't know when they started, but like, I always think of anti-hero as the biggest anti-hero is for me a Punisher and Venom. Yeah. Venom, I think, might have had his first um, solo series in the 90s as well. Because uh, he's, he's a Spider-Man Jackie. spin-off, isn't he? Yes. Spider-Man villain turn anti-hero yeah. now. But yeah, so it's interesting that with this one, the big play of his of the character's morality is now a big plot point. Yeah. It's like, is he a hero or not? He's literally a mercenary who does things for money. But the first issue is him kind of saving the day. Well, I mean, it's him going against his better judgment to save the day, isn't it? Well. So he he sort of prevents an issue of his own creation in yeah. a lot of sense. And he was given wrong, incorrect or intentionally wrong information by the 
job that he's carrying out. Sasquatch, by the way. Yes. I've from met him. Hulk, yeah. I've met him in Hulk. Yeah. And he was working on gamma ray stuff. And he was working on he was working on nuclear shit, wasn't he? Yeah, that gamma was really specifically. interesting. Specifically. That was really interesting to me. Um but yeah, so basically Deadpool goes to destroy a reactor, ends up jumping in the reactor and stopping it from blowing because he doesn't want to give a bunch of people cancer. And that's the thing that changes it for him. Like, mm. he's already on the fence because the, the character Sasquatch, Lang Langowski, I think his surname yeah, is, Langowski. something like that, is like, he's like, hey, I thought this place was unoccupied and I was just going to blow it up. And turns out not only are there people here, but there's a bloody reactor here. But also, Sasqu I know Sasquatch is like, you idiot Deadpool, you almost hit the reactor. Grabs him, throws him at the reactor, yeah. makes a crack, and then he's like, don't move that it's like you just had a go at him for like you idiot but isn't the general sense like the general sense of sasquatch's character that he's a very smart person who when he's sasquatch he makes really dumb decisions yeah i guess so. but even as a sasquatch he's like <laughs> he's like having a go it's like you you idiot um but yeah it's the point where he he says uh, it's not just the reactor's going to explode because deadpool's like oh, who cares like we're out in the arctic and he's like no no entire southern hemisphere that's yeah. what's going to be affected and it's only he's already a bit like mm, oh, maybe i should do something and it's the point where langowski says yeah entire southern hemisphere, ugh, entire southern hemisphere the lucky ones i think would like die first and then the and unlucky then, ones would get horrible cancer yeah and it's the mention of horrible cancer that clicks for deadpool he goes oh, right yeah and I'm that's to and say you know this. and and that's like you can't talk about deadpool without talking about the big city can you no it's it's literally his the biggest part of his kind of origin really isn't yeah. it yeah and so, in terms of arc, there are some things that I really liked about this overarching story. Mm. So, I like the idea that we had that misdirect where he got sent the glove, his regenerative powers have stopped working. Instead of him finding the person he thinks he's going to find, he finds the guy from, what is it called? Uh, Department K, which I think is a subsidiary or offshoot or sequel, essentially, to Weapon X. Yeah, so he finds the Weapon X scientist that turned him into Deadpool. Dr. Kilbrew. Dr. Kilbrew. And I thought that was a really nice misdirect, and it was at that point that I was like, yeah, this story's hotting up now. Yeah. Because I thought we were just going to get superhero shenanigans, and then we actually got some depth from Deadpool. And I think what was fun was that it was a character balancing two quite unlikable traits. Mm. So he's balancing his desire to kill this guy against his desire to get in Siren's pants. Essentially. Like, he wants to impress Siren, he wants her to like him, mm. but he also wants to kill this guy. I feel like it. the dialogue does go a way past him just trying to impress Siren. Like, At points, but that's the that's the overarching theme for me. I wouldn't say so. I would disagree. Only because I think initially, yes, like the whole reason she's there in the first place is because he's crushing on her and hoping that they can grow closer. But at the very end, it's the reason that he doesn't kill him. Kind of, yeah. But then it's also, the only reason he doesn't kill him. Remember, as he's leaving, mm. he says, "Don't thank me, thank her." Yeah, but I think it goes more beyond morality, his own morality, than impressing her and i don't know that it does or maybe the two i think are, that's the charm of it may, maybe but i think what did it for me what tells me it's not about impressing her was when at one point he tell she's she vocalizes i'm do not i'm not happy with you killing him so yeah. he says okay leave yeah so that tells me it's not about impressing her he doesn't have a problem with her knowing he's going to kill him and the, and he knows she's against it he has a problem with her being there and seeing him doing it so it's yeah. it's not for me that was the part that emphasized it's not about impressing her but he does not want her to see him as this bad like this evil kind of state <sighs> yeah but evil like this this darker place vengeful yes vengeful, vengeful yeah. is probably the word i'd use so if it's just if 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 he was just lying to her like and he does try and lie about it later <laughs> but i think in that moment he's not thinking about impressing her but he is worried about her seeing him permanently as a vengeful you know, yeah. guy, as a vengeful person. So, yeah. And I think, to be fair, I'm not even saying I'm right. Like, I, I think what's good about this is it, you have a few ways you can look at it. Yeah, totally. Like, it's, it's, it's open to interpretation. And I think it comes down to how you read the dialogue, doesn't mm. it? Deadpool's dialogue is pretty good here. It's, it's very quippy in the first two issues. But, and the point I was going to make is... Even though I didn't like how quippy it was in the first two, it actually made the weight of the tone yeah. change in issue three much bigger. So it's it paid off because this guy who I was like, 
oh yeah, he's going really hard on the quips now. Like, I don't remember it being this quip yeah. when I first read it. Then we got to issue three. I was like, oh, he's not making jokes now. Yeah, and totally. that hit a lot harder. Yeah, it, it kind of added a levity to it, didn't yeah. it? And just in case anyone's interested, issue two was an introduction of a character, Taskmaster. Yeah. Who, his whole th- and Taskmaster, funny thing about him, I've said before about characters who are consistently well-written across different writers. Yeah. Nowadays, He's one of my favorite characters because he's just like like a no bullshit have mercenary. He's a bit of fun. I don't think you have. No, I've read him in a lot of stuff, but um, he's very sporadic. Like he'll yeah. just be used very here and now, like then and there by certain writers. But yeah. he's always written as a no nonsense mercenary. Mm. By no nonsense, I don't mean like I'll get the job done. He's a guy who's like, "Yep, you pay me and I'll get it done wherever you need." And they're like, "Okay, so this job involves a punish." He's like, "I'm out." Like right. he's that kind of guy who's like, nope, not doing it. Like that guy's there's I read a solo series by him where someone frames him for a murder of Nick Fury. Yeah. And he's got Black Widow chasing after him. And he's just full on like, she's gonna murder me. <laughs> I'm running. Like yeah. he's he's funny and but not overly funny. Whereas in here, he was like Saturday morning cartoon villain. A little bit, yeah, but I suppose he needed to be, because they were setting up this whole new series and yeah. And his whole thing is if you don't know Taskmaster, he has so I, they have a specific name for it. I can't remember what it's called. I think it's kinetic photo mem- photographic memory or something like that. Yeah. But basically, if he sees a move done, he can do that move perfectly himself immediately. And we see it play out because he fights like Deadpool. Yes. And Deadpool's doing all his standard moves. And he's like, ah, the crane kick. Like, yeah. very effective, but also can be deflected with this. Like, yeah. that kind of stuff. And then the funny thing about it is Deadpool works out the if he just doesn't fight normally then he can uh, surprise taskmaster so he starts dancing instead of fighting yeah and taskmaster's like i have no idea what this is i can't copy it like i can't do anything about it and then deadpool beats him so yeah. bit of fun but again by that point i was like yeah this is fun but there's not a lot of kick punch in this though that's the only real kick punchy moment yeah and th- that's the thing we get very quickly i think that's because it's all he had done up to that point right okay and very quickly they were like let's give him a proper you know yeah uh, and i noticed that there's like there used to be a thing where there was a different uh story every issue which this was the case yeah but the third issue was just talking and conversation wasn't and it? issues three four and five kind of had a through thread yes but th- issue four was very much a Deadpool versus the Hulk. But yeah. It was entrenched in the, the overarching story. And I liked that issue. That was a fun one. I really liked the sense that, well, I suppose something that interests me in comic books, now that I've delved into, into them, is seeing these lesser powered heroes. Mm. So seeing people like Dick Grayson or to a certain degree, um, Bruce Wayne Jr. Oh, Damien, yeah. Yeah, seeing people like them do their thing. Especially when they're interacting with powerful characters. Or when we saw the, um, what's her name, Khan, Miss Marvel. Oh, Kamala Khan. Kamala Khan in the early Miss Marvel stuff where she hadn't gotten grips with her powers yet. Yeah. And so it was really nice that we had this moment where, you know, um, the, the good doctor says to deadpool you know you need so you need gamma rays you need gamma, gamma radiated blood yeah well you need gamma radiated you need some form of gamma radiated stuff that you can ingest and he was like hulk's blood would probably do it and wayne's wade's like no <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's no fucking way i'm gonna try and get some blood out of the hulk and also at this point he was depowered he didn't have his healing factor I think yeah. he takes one shot from the Hulk and he's yeah. like, I cannot take that again. He's like, missing a finger. Yeah. Which for a sword fighter, for a guy who wields two katanas and a gun, mm. missing a finger is a pretty debilitating thing. I think he's probably used to operating with missing limbs because I think I just, this is my headcan head and stuff. I just assume that he has a lot of experience where he's, there's a short period of time where he's fighting missing a limb or something yeah so he's like literally mid fight waiting for it to grow back because that's normally how quickly they grow back Mm. and then so yeah he's probably like used to at least missing fingers and whatnot yeah that's my assumption but he's fighting the hulk underpowered yes and makes a pretty good turn of it but he does it despite his better judgment and i enjoyed that whole passage and the thing about him is he's he's like peak athletic human so when fighting the hulk this hulk his speed is the thing that yeah. l- at least makes him last a little longer. And to be fair, Hulk is not going full tilt. Like, no. He, oh, at worst, he considers Deadpool annoying. Yeah. He's just like, just, just leave me alone. Like, he's like that. He's not like hateful or, you know, vengeful against Deadpool. And this is something else I wanted to talk about. And it's sort of ancillary to the story, really. But it's always interesting to me whenever I see Hulk in something because there's so many different intelligence levels for Hulk. Yes. 
We have a very intelligent articular Hulk here. I wouldn't say very intelligent. I'd say normal intelligence. Well, I mean, he's certainly not operating at Hulk smash levels. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's higher he, than that, but he's not quite Dr. Green or Devil Hulk, which are like no. quite eloquent and intelligent. But, it's in, but there are moments of eloquence there. There's moments where he's using like multisyllabic words and stuff. And yeah. you're like, that's not Hulk. That's Banner. Mm. And it's obviously Hulk and not Banner, but you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. it is an inconsistency with like when you look at the entire Hulk run. Yeah. Like most of the time there's explanations. There's times like, oh, I've merged my brain with the Hulks or, oh no, I made, I tried to get rid of the Hulk and I made him smart. And now he's got my intelligence and yeah. Bruce, I'm Bruce Banner. I'm dumb now or whatever. But I think also a lot of times, like in this instance, another eyes used the Hulk and they've just gone, I don't know what he's like right now. Like, I'm just going to write him normal. Like, yeah. And it's, I always find this because there's there's no deus ex character here nope, nope i love that that's a trope that we've named yes but you know why there's no deus ex character why it's because no one likes deadpool that was right. a common thing here deadpool yeah. is considered very annoying and at this point he's a mercenary so most heroes consider him a bad guy like yeah. if anything they've only interacted with him when he's been on the other side of something because he's been paid to like be the bad guy for a week yeah so no one's a fan of him but he had this one instance in a previous limited series with siren so this is like his only superhero friend at this point later right. on like modern deadpool is kind of friends with everyone everyone's kind of like yeah he's annoying but he's all right like that's most people yeah and i suppose to a certain degree wade wilson's quite effective mm. oh yeah he's deadly like he is a trained mercenary and a assassin essentially mm. uh one interesting thing one of the people that deadpool likes most is biggest fan of is captain america and that's because what during this period where for like decades where everyone hates deadpool captain america is one of the few people who treat him with respect really yeah. well i suppose that's cap isn't exactly. it? exactly so deadpool is like i would die for you like i will fucking lay down for you which actually huge tangent do you remember um uh, post civil war 2 it was revealed soon after that that cap oh no even before that but along this time captain america was hydra do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was in the news. I remember that was on like BBC News. <laughs> so like Captain America's Hydra. Like, well, I suppose um, turning a, an absolute symbol of like all that's right with America mm. into what is essentially an allegory for Russian um, espionage. Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty big deal, isn't it? Yeah. Co on a cultural level. And what's interesting is around that time, Deadpool was became a Hydra agent. Mm. When so at one point he came out as Hydra and he was like we're hydra we're good now because i'm there and you know mm. like we're going to take over the world basically deadpool followed him because he was like well if cap's doing it then it must be right like, i wish we'd gotten deadpool in the avengers series not as an avenger mm. but you know that last big battle i mean he's definitely going to be in the next one where everyone's there right yeah. Like, everyone shows up. You'd think somebody would have been like, should we give Wade a call? He's definitely going to be in the next one. Is he? Oh, yeah. Have you not seen the, the trailer for Deadpool 3? No, I've kept pretty... Do you want to keep, like, do you want me to tell you anything about it? Well, we can talk about it, yeah. So, in the, I mean, spoilers for the trailer for Deadpool, which is in itself kind of spoilers for the film. If you really don't want to know anything about yeah. it, skip forward two minutes. Or there'll be a time code. Yeah. I'm making work for you in saying there's going to be a yeah. time code. Ryan will do a time code. All I'm going to say is very quickly is... um. He gets picked up by the TVA, who are characters from the Loki TV series. So right. MCU, their whole thing is maintain the timeline. And the whole plot, plot of it is the Fox and Marvel timeline, which is the spy, uh, not Spider-Man, X-Men and Fantastic Four films. Yeah. That's, um, that world is being destroyed and he's trying to save his universe. So it's parallel alongside the MCU, which he uh, knows about because he's a fourth wall breaking character. That's super cool. Yeah. With one point where he's being like hired by the TVA essentially to try and help them in some way. And he goes, are you saying I'm Marvel Jesus? And they're like, no, we're not saying that at all. So yeah. So he's definitely going to be rolled into the Avengers, like the MCU. Oh. He's definitely going to be in the next Avengers film. He'd, I mean, watching him, I suppose the thing is the Avengers in the cinematic universe is going to be changing a lot because there's no Tony Stark. So really, Peter Parker is going to be our new kind of tech guy, isn't he? And like, there's going to be a lot of changes. But watching Dead, watching Wade Wilson interact with Tony Stark, watching RBJ and Ryan Reynolds play off each other would have been magnificent. Well, RDJ has said about wanting to come back. But how? There would be. There's there'd have to be so much fuckery. Ways. There's a. I mean, I look, suppose they'd have to make an entire Avengers film where it was all the Avengers going. We need Tony back. <laughs> not necessarily. I mean, I mean, they're doing all the multiverse stuff now. 
there's multiverse characters, so a alternate to universe Tony Stark is probably going to be the way they're going to do it. I don't want a universe Tony Stark that hasn't had all the emotional growth that he had would suck. Potentially, my favorite way that they won't do, but I think would be great, would be a hologram version of himself, like a Jarvis version of himself that he's made. What, but- force ghosting? Maybe, like hologramming, <laughs> but like a Jarvis. You want you want Tony Stark to force but, ghosts. But here's the kicker, he's evil. <sighs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I okay. think that'd be interesting. Okay. Whether it be good or not. So yeah, story-wise, back to the comic, uh, we get to issue five where basically it's just him ruminating on whether or not to kill Dr. Kilbrew. Yeah. Because his healing factors come back for the most part. Not for the most part. Yeah. I mean, he can he can now, I mean, Dr. Kilbrew says it quite eloquently, doesn't he? You know, you can handle the bumps and scrapes that you'll get doing hero work, mm. but you're not going to regenerate limbs anymore. Yeah. Which is kind of Deadpool's thing is that full on regeneration. Like you yes. can come into a million pieces and one of them will grow a new Deadpool, right? His healing factor is quicker and faster than Wolverine's. Yeah. But the fan theory, I think, or the occasional explanation for it is because uh, Wolverine's healing fact is also constantly fighting adamantium poisoning from his yeah. bones. So it's like, if he didn't have that, Wolverine's would be as fast as Deadpool's. But Wade's is, Wade's is constantly battling pretty prolific cancer, isn't it? Yeah, but it's more like it's it's exercising the thing that it does, yeah. regenerating lost tissue, whereas Wolverine's is fighting poisoning. So yeah. you, you, could, you could say that's different. I like, mean, that's... Deep comic book nerd stuff, isn't it? They, yeah, I mean, we're in the weeds now. Can't say we're not a proper comic book podcast. No, and I often wonder how in how, of how much interest that stuff is when you get right down to brass tacks with it. The problem is, and this is my issue with comics, is that um, there's so much canon that there's no point trying to be like, okay, what happened here? Like, what's this history of character? Like, it's all a mess. Yeah, there's no point. My advice to anyone who's wants to get into comics is. Find comics you like. Um, by enjoy them. <laughs> find comics you like and enjoy them, but follow artists and writers. Yeah, Don't totally. follow the following characters. I have read comics of a certain character that were written amazingly, and I've gone, oh, I love this character now. And then I read the next volume written by someone else and go, oh, it was the writing I loved, not the character. Me and Miles Morales. Exactly. Uh, me and Mr. Miracle, because the first yeah. one I read was Tom King, and that was amazing. And I read some stuff after, so I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, brother, uh. so yeah, follow creators, don't worry about that. But yeah, Deadpool, I like I said before, I just happened to read a bunch of his backstory stuff because I was that I thought that's what you were meant to do at the yeah. time. So he's the that's one. That's kind of who most... you were at the time yes, as well. Exactly. A completionist. So that's why I have all this back knowledge of uh, of Deadpool lore and stuff. So yeah, issue five, again, just going back and forth on whether it's kill or not. Yeah. Um, I did know it's a plot hole in Go this whole story. It well, it might not be a plot hole because we are only tip of the iceberg into the whole story less than 10 percent. it's never explained why his healing factor went in the first place it is oh, okay because of the I, dunking in the gamma radiation no that delay that helped it no no so that fixed him that's how they work out that gamma oh blood will yeah fix of him course out. it is sorry no you're yeah. right abs- you're absolutely right i was trying to look Although back to find kilbrew kind of basically said that what i did wasn't a permanent fix no. so they kind of explained it but they but no but it must have been happening before he hit the gamma in the first issue and then it, that delayed it slightly, but they need more. Yeah, I see of what you mean. It's all a bit serendipitous, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But the reason I caught myself was I was like, that could be explained later on. Yeah. Because so, then at the end of issue five, we have this whole thing with this character, T Ray, who hates Deadpool for seemingly no reason. But I do remember he, that he becomes the next well, big arc uh, t- antagonist. I was about to say, how much of this run did you read the first time around? All of it. So you, you have a rough understanding of where it goes. All of it years ago. All, yeah. The only thing I properly remember. Puberty's hit you since then. <laughs> is that um, all I remember properly is that they get into his backstory in like they actually show it. So by this point, his backstory is told, yeah, but it's shown later in this series to the point where you know how like angry like that's a note I made was what was refreshing about the character was seeing how angry he got when talking about the was it the the warehouse yeah where he was essentially experimented the workshop. on the workshop and one of the lines he uses when he's talking about it was i screamed so loud i didn't even recognize my own voice yeah and just a line like that with no jokes or puns at all and even afterwards when he's talking about his own debt like his own mortality he's joking about that yeah he's like oh my he's, he makes a joke like i'm gonna die before i get my next issue of or before I, my subscription of some funny 
Uh, it was like, like God, yeah. He said, I've, uh, "He said I've got like a six-year subscription to like Big Guns or something." That's it. Yeah. yeah. So his mortality, he's fine joking about. Yeah. But the torture he went through to become Deadpool is just like so such a searing pain in his memory. I really liked this iteration of Deadpool. Yeah. I really liked this iteration of Wade Wilson. I and and you you've touched on it earlier as well, which is that as the kind of severity of the story and the action starts to ramp up, he becomes more serious and he becomes more grounded. And you see this really sort of pragmatic side to the character. And I found that really interesting. I found it quite compelling. Yeah. And this is what drew me to the character, like uh, uh, reading this, ta- like at, at the time, reading this comic. Um, and it does grow and does go on. And then we get to later volumes where I, where I think he's the best is where they nail the comedy to the seriousness. Yeah. So he does move past this whole thing, this whole kind of previous torture and the stuff he went through. And then it becomes more of a rumination on, again, using rumination, because that's a great word. Um, It becomes more about his morality and his Mm. place in the world as like, am I a hero? Like, can I be good? That kind of stuff. Just going back to that idea of like comedy and drama. Mm. That's a conversation that happens a lot when you study Shakespeare at a high level. Yep. So, you know, and that, and that's, you know, we, we, when we talk about Shakespeare, particularly in English, that's often held up as some of the greatest literature written in our language. And one of the things that's so sort of commented upon and beloved by English professors mostly about Shakespeare's work is that there is high drama in the comedy mm. and high comedy in his tragedies. Mm. Like there's so much tragedy that happens in his comedies. Look at Midsummer Night's Dream and everything that happens there. It's truly tragic. And then even in King Lear, where it is like the most tragic of all of his tragedies, there is comedy in it as well. Yeah. And I think hitting that balance in something like this is what elevates it from the humdrum to the sublime. Yep, yep. And this is the problem with my problem, because I'm not reading modern Deadpool. No, you're not, are you? And it's because they've just, like I said, because of the success of the character, they've made him way too jokey. Way too, um, what's the word for it? I think there's a word for it, but I can't remember the top of my head. So I'm going to go, I'm going to stick with Jokey for now. Jokey's fine. Yeah. But they, he's just a joke character now. Mm. And they, they're they completely missing the point of their character, which is the underlying tragedy of him. Yeah. Um, it's gone across really well in the series that we're going to be looking at maybe next week or the week after. I can't remember the order right now off the top of my head. Actually a bit next week as well. We're actually going to be going across like his biggest ongoing series but points oh. individual points from it that cool. kind of correlate with the film so get ready for that listeners Clever. well done yeah and then the fourth week the week of the film releasing i think we should do modern deadpool because yeah, then totally. we'll do whatever's coming out and we can we can compare and basically you can join me on the bad wagon of god deadpool was better back in my day because that's yeah. gonna be us uh, so can we get on to one of my gripes sure is that okay siren yes you- she's described as being irish you did not like her Irish writing or like dialogue? Well, because it wasn't Irish. Yeah. So they so is she supposed to be Irish? Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. So why is she saying Och ne? There's literally a point where she says Och. That's a Scottish accent. And the way they've tried to portray an Irish accent in writing here is just to apostrophize a lot of vowel sounds out of words. Yeah. That's not how an Irish accent sounds. I think this is very much a American's idea of Irish, which, yeah, but, 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 it's still you, to be criticised. If you're going to write a fucking Irish character, at the very least, use aspects of the Irish dialect, not the Scottish dialect, mm. because they've. I used, think they confuse them. I, well, I think they did, yeah. and I think that's a huge... Not, not just specifically here. I think Americans generally confuse... But that's a huge Irish failing in something that... If, if, you, if you're going to introduce a specific character detail like that, get it the fuck right. I would have much rather heard her speaking in a standard American dialect. I would much rather they didn't try. Mm. Because what they've I done here is... I think this character was already established Irish. Like, they weren't created for this series, so... No. I think they've had to use them and been like, "Uh, I can't be asked to research Irish. Like, it's a fair point. It's the 90s. It would have literally taken them half an hour to watch an episode of Father Ted. Mm. All they would have needed to have done is watch an episode of Father Ted. But did they have Father Ted back then? Did they have the VHSs? Well, but this is the thing, isn't it? You'd you'd think think if you were... So, if you were were told you'd have to... You wrote a story and you were introducing an Irish character. You think you'd have taken 10 fucking minutes... To, to find out what an Irish person sounds like and not just gone, oh, it's one of the British accents that isn't English. I'm mm. just going to make her sound 
occasionally Scottish, but mostly not British or Irish at all. Yeah. Again, I don't know which, I don't know whether she's supposed to be from the Republic or the North. We don't know. So I'm very sorry to my Irish listeners if I refer to her as British. It, she potentially might still be British. Mm. But they've they've taken a stab at something resembling either an Irish or a British accent here and fucking flubbed it. Yeah. And to me, it's just so egregious. And I don't know if this is just my sort of parochial hatred of the way that Irish, Scottish, Welsh, English people are represented in American media sometimes, but it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to get that right. It's it's an hour's research. But also for them, I don't think they even realise that they're getting it wrong. So I don't no. think they even think there's even to, to be researched, if that makes sense. Like, I think they think they've already got it. So why bother researching it? You hear stories, sense. don't you? You hear stories from Irish people where they're in like Belfast or something. Or no, they'll be in Dublin and an American come out, will come over and be like, oh yeah, my great granddad was from Dublin, so I'm British too. And you're like, oh, that's really yeah. bad. That's so, that's so insensitive, my guy. Yeah. And this just felt like a really insensitive way to handle an Irish accent. You had a similar reaction, I believe, to Butcher and Huey and the boys. They're a British and a Scottish character and they were just using different stuff weren't they yeah no, particularly huey particularly the scottish character they did not nail his dialect no and they try and he was meant to be glaswegian as well wasn't he i think so yeah which is like a very distinct accent They're definitely i i will give it to americans i did not i would never expect them to know the, even the difference between like glaswegian and edinburgh like i th that's way beyond their scope well, absolutely and and i and i and I, I i can appreciate that in britain and ireland we are two very small countries with a lot of diversity and accent i understand that mm. you know i mean i was just chatting with a northerner last night who was trying to impersonate my accent and he kept going west country mm. which is like are we lovely and it's like no norfolk so you're right boy they're I, different i even struggle with the norfolk accent <laughs> yeah and you grew up here right exactly um but for me it's just it took me out of the story a little bit yeah. And I and I know that's a, I know I'm quite singular in that because I do have a standing fascination with accents and linguistics, and so I'm quite attuned to people's accents and I can clock an accent quite quickly. And I've also read a lot of literature where people have presented accents really well. Hmm. So I'm a huge fan of the of Train Spotting and Skag Boys, which obviously has probably one of the best representations of like a Leith or Edinburgh accent in literature. Or I've read a lot of James Joyce, where he really beautifully transcribes in the Dubliners. He transcribes Irish accents onto the page in just the most fluid and stunning way. And so those resources are there for people. It wouldn't, you know, what, this is 97? Yeah. The internet existed. It wouldn't have taken a lot for somebody to Google up the Dubliners, have a look at what an Irish accent actually looked like when it was transcribed into literature and had a pop at it. I reckon this is a purely speculation i reckon that she had already been written that way in x-men comics mm. so joe kelly probably went well, i'm just gonna do that it, no one's complained yet so i'm just gonna do that the same yeah and, and, and i understand that this is a parochial parochial complaint mm. and i understand that this is i am an english person who has a standing fascination with english irish scottish welsh accents complaining about an american comic from the 90s not getting it right yeah but it didn't get it right I would say modern day, I think they are a lot more keen on that kind of stuff for a, the idea of like representation amongst like all types of people. And I think the way that English, Irish, British people were represented in American media back then was a bit different. Yeah, with stereotypes for sure. Yeah, I mean, they, they still deal in a lot of heavy stereotypes, but there's there's this fetishization of English people that happens in America, particularly Irish people. I'd say all kinds of European people. For di well, not all, but a lot of European people for different reasons. Like, yeah. English people are very prim and proper. Nowadays, I think because of, like, certain characters, they're like the boys' TV show, Butcher in there is always like, hello, you cunts. Like, that's, I think now they're readjusting their stereotype yeah. of British people based on characters like that um obviously irish people are always drunk scottish people are always drunk these are the stereotypes i'm not saying that literally um unless you are irish or scottish listening and you are drunk in which case well i mean if it's after four if it's after yeah, four o'clock in the evening exactly um french people are obviously very uh cultural and romantic same as like italian people this is like all the, the generalizations that their characters yes. go by 
which is why it's quite funny when they're in the boys the character frenchie had this backstory about was it um, not even potentially being french well his backstory was involved jousting with baguettes so that raised the question of like are you just taking the piss did or? you know that's fully real i tried to tell you that that was real but i couldn't find any evidence of it i found some evidence wow. subsequent to our conversation it, ha- it, it doesn't happen often but you're there are instances s- you're gonna have to send me to there are instances where that has occurred where people have jousted on push bikes in france with baguettes all right we will circle back to that because that's an important topic um on the topics on the slightly related topic of like representation stuff do you notice there was some up to the line not quite pc like jokes and stuff from deadpool yes i thought for 90s comic probably doing a lot better than most others at the time well yeah i mean so the last thing we read from this sort of era like the last the last the last big conversation we had about changing cultural standards in media was when we read the boys and that's from the noise isn't it yes it is and i would argue that i mean this, this has a different tone Comparing it to The Boys or anything by Garth Ennis is yeah. is quite different because Garth Ennis is known to be like the edgelord comic book writer, yeah, essentially. He was there to push boundaries, wasn't he? Yes. But, I mean, we've not got Deadpool there using the G slur and calling things gay. No. And, we, you know, we've not, we've not got... There's no, overt, there's no particularly overt homophobia. There's no racism. There's no misogyny, particularly. No. I, more, when I say up to the line, it's, there was more things like... There's one part where he literally addresses PC where he's, talking, he's making fun of Blind Al for being blind. Yeah. But then the joke in that is, despite the fact that she's blind, she still, like, outsmarts and pulls over things yeah, over so Deadpool. Yeah, so he tries to put salt in her coffee... And it turns out that she's already switched the salt and the sugar, so he puts salt in his cereal and sugar on her coffee. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. That's a funny joke. But also, I think there is a thing with them and their relationship, and this is kind of represented accurately in the Deadpool film, the first one at least, is they are always against each other because they're both kind of like curmudgeons. Like, yeah. She's not like a happy-go-lucky person who happens to be blind, and then Deadpool's torturing her. Like, the reason they kind of kidnapped her and first place is because he's sensitive about how he looks and he needs a housemate or roommate yeah, to not be lonely. So this is something interesting because i would not experienced this before. I assume she was a willing participant in his life but here she, he kidnaps her. But in the sense that I think the, only, the reason he says he kidnaps her, it, whether it's true or not in terms of like where it started mm. I think what it really does come down to and again this might just be me inferring but he doesn't want to admit that he needs someone. Yeah. So he'd rather be like I've kidnapped her and she's my slave or that kind of stuff. It's like she could leave at any time mm. like she doesn't want to like just because she's blind like the door's not locked like yeah. she go she answers the door to a, a girl scout yeah um, girl scout selling cookies and is just like hey wade we've got like she scares the kid with her eyes because yeah. her eyes are all fucked up and she threatens to use her x a mutant x-ray vision on yeah her. so she's obviously a bad person as well but then that's, yeah but then that's like a bit of levity where it's like they're both they don't get on with anyone else she's got nowhere else to go but they do find company. It's like an odd couple thing, isn't it? Yes, and even though they're like pranking each other and stuff, and there's one point where literally Deadpool says, she's like, hey, you've got me all turned around. Where am I? And he's like, oh, you're right in front of your room. Like, just step forward. And she's right in front of a staircase. But even then, I feel like she's so smart to what he does. I don't think she believed him in that moment. Yeah, totally. But then equally, there's a joke in the Deadpool film that also has the blind owl character where he is about to go on this big mission she's giving him like a bit of a pep talk to like come on you can do this whatever he's like yeah you're right and he's about to go it's like oh by the way there's uh i've hidden colombian cocaine somewhere in the flat and the police are on their way (laughs) like have fun like so again he's making fun of her blindness but it's in that way i don't know your mom your miles may vary on who you are and your experiences and that maybe that's more affecting to you reading it but it doesn't feel as like derogatory punching down like it feels like he is himself a pretty fucked up character as well like there's this interesting thing that happens in modern culture and i don't want to go too far into it because i don't want to be that guy but i've already passed an hour (laughs) yeah but i've noticed a trope where people get offended on other people's behalves these days which is fine you just noticed that (laughs) well no but you know what i mean like that's the trend is a thing that happens yeah that's what we're trending towards isn't it is that you know people people get offended on other people's behalves and i think it's valid to sort of know and challenge injustice where you see it but also it would be really disingenuous of me to get super offended at somebody making blind gags 
particularly as I grew up with a disabled parent. Mm. I have not talked about this on the podcast before, but I think this is a really interesting moment to do so. The Deadpool episode was the the one to... Yeah. yeah. And there are jokes that happen in my family that people might get offended by. Mm. But the answer that I would have for them is, you are getting offended on my dad's behalf. I am his son who grew up with him and who loves him. And he takes the piss out of me and we take the piss out of each other. But it's this beautiful, well-natured way. It's a very in my, British way as well. Yeah, that in my family, we have always treated my dad's disability because I don't see him as being less than. I don't even, you know, I don't see him as this person that needs pity. I see him as a really strong, independent man who happens to have had some health stuff for the past 30 years. Hmm. And so actually, when we, when, when we make jokes about it, that's part of his, it's, it's a part of him and making jokes about stuff is a part of his character. And so I think this is a really beautiful representation of actually one of the ways that people deal with disability. Yeah. There's an interesting thing. There's two interesting, th interesting things that I've heard both from the same source, which is Jimmy Carr who I just happened to see two separate things like years apart, but they both relate to this. One is he had a joke one point that he was getting in trouble for. By in trouble, I just mean some people were complaining about it. Yeah. And the joke was, it was, um, it was during the war, the Iraq war, and it was about, yeah, we've had a lot of soldiers coming back with missing limbs and stuff yeah. due to um, was it IEDs on the road and stuff. Like, but on the plus side, we have a great Special Olympics here. Yeah, I remember that. And what was funny about that was when people were then start kicking off about the joke, he said, he came out and said, by the way, I didn't write that joke. I heard that in a um, soldier's uh, hospital ward where they, <laughs> that was a joke they told each other yeah. because that was their way of dealing with it, was yeah. to make light of it. Um, so on the one hand, is, that's an interesting aspect. But the other, more recently, is people, he's, been on interviews and stuff that some podcasts that i occasionally listen to and he's talked about this idea that people are again taking issue with certain jokes and in within comedy specifically this idea of not punching down like that's been a yeah. thing for ages it's like don't punch down punch up like people use that as just a quick hand to like who it's, you should or should not make fun of. jimmy far doesn't jimmy Carr doesn't have very far to punch up though the tax well, evading decades yes. <laughs> who which he he wrote himself for as well absolutely yeah but, and and it's so interesting because there is this huge disparity between jimmy Carr in, in the context of his comedy and then jimmy Carr when you just see him in conversation because Jimmy Carr in conversation says some really beautifully enlightened things. Yes. And he's a really interesting bloke. And then his comedy is like lowest common denominator one-liners. Yes. <laughs> but what he said about the whole punching up, punching down thing was, when someone said that to him, his response now is, why do you think of it as punching down? Or like, why do you think of whoever the target of the joke is? Like, why do you think of them as punching down? Like, yeah. do you, are you putting yourself above them? Yeah. Like, and that becomes a new way to look at it. Yeah. And again, that is not a pull pass for just like, oh, you can make fun of anyone and it's fine. Like, mm. that's, not the, what I'm, that's not what I'm saying at all. I suppose, because I don't know if the listeners know this, but you had another life at one point as an aspiring stand-up comedian in London, didn't you? I prefer to think of it as failed comedian, but yes. <laughs> I mean, only you could say that. I, yeah. can't, I can't say that. That's cruel. <laughs> Us failed comedians can say that. <laughs> But I suppose this is something that you potentially had to think about a lot, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I, it's more, I've heard more enlightening stuff like that since then. So, and so you had a really rich understanding of appropriateness and mm. that's what, and that's where I think the line gets crossed is when, you know, it's, it's when, is when white people try and make humor about black culture and it's like, come on, my guy, not your culture, you know? But then there are people who, there are certain comedians who are able to do that, but because they, there's a thing where I think there's an intuitive past where someone can make jokes about culture if it comes across as well-informed. Yeah. Um, Bill Burr is one who, like, he's made jokes about that because he's, like, he has had so many interaction conversation with people to the point where his wife is black so he has made mm. jokes about that he's observed yeah about black culture but but it it comes across where like the people who are seeing the joke and especially black people are like oh we that's correct like you're or like you know enough about the culture to get and it. i think within that context it would be really weird for other white people to get offended on his wife's behalf right like that just seems weird to me yes but also in the same in the same vein 
just because you that is not the same as like well i have a black friend so i can make that joke like yeah. that's not like it at all there is the problem really when it comes down to everything is there is a level of nuance that most people won't have when mm. just listening to a surface level joke and yeah. there's jokes certain people can tell to certain people because they know they don't mean it yeah when you're hearing a stranger on a stage or even just like a person you don't know well enough making a joke like that you don't know if it's coming from a genuine place of like levity and like not hate mm. uh, you there's unfortunately a big problem with people who are genuinely hateful who use jokes like that to test the waters to yeah. be like how do you feel about this like if i just make a little joke and yeah. if you're okay with that like is like that unfortunately is a real thing yeah it absolutely hum humor is like the first place that somebody will start to introduce hate speech yes so the ultimate thing we're saying is we don't know we are not the people to best talk about this we just have some thoughts on it that are related to our experiences i mean we're, we're not the best people to talk about most topics mate. <laughs> except comics except comics in which we have ultimate authority because we've read at least one comic book this week exactly so time for just my quick little bits at the end oh this uh, is the end yeah oh hey was it hey we oh, i've forgotten i've forgotten the i've forgotten the intro thing that the theme tune that we do every single week so just jump in uh so Hold up, way. Ryan's got a few more things to say. There, there we go. Um, breaking the fourth wall joke right at the beginning with the yeah. narration joke. I thought you might like that yeah, especially. Yeah, I did like that. Um, and then there was one at the start of like issue three or issue two. Pro probably. I yeah, might not there know was. Yeah, there was another I'm one. I'm thinking one at issue one specifically where he's narrating and then someone goes, is someone talking? Yeah. Um, a translation joke where yeah. they're translating the Spanish. Yeah. And one of the translations was, no, no, no. So they actually added a box to translate that for everyone, which I thought was cool. Um, the vibe, definitely Looney Tunes inspired, which I quite liked. Um, Did you think? I thought some parts where like it got a bit more comedic, like Deadpool gets way more Looney Tunes I after this. Yeah, I thought this was pretty grounded for Deadpool. I wouldn't have really said that was like an observation. More like him and how he's kind of, you know, we're like a Bugs Bunny kind of character who's like fast talking and making jokes. Like he had that vibe at moments. I I don't know that he did here, but I, I can see, I can see, I can definitely see in some of the later Deadpool stuff that I've read that that was definitely like a trope. Yeah. And last little bit, which I was going to talk about when we were talking about the deeper stuff, but yeah. one of the other lines that I really liked is when Deadpool is talking about he's trying to convince Siren that he should be able to kill Dr. Kilburn. Mm. And he's like, she's like, won't let him do it. And he says, I can't believe you're, why are you going out of your way to defend this excuse for a human being who's done loads of evil stuff and isn't worth like breathing anymore like why are you defending him and she says um stuck up I've, for you i've stood up i've stood up for you haven't i yeah and his he he is silent and then just says leave like he doesn't have rebuttal for that because that is the ultimate like you do not have you cannot just because he's harmed you directly yeah you can't make the argument of well he's bad he doesn't deserve to live it's like well why do you deserve then and I really liked that relationship, even though I detested her dialogue at every yes. point. Um, I really liked that really tender moment at the end when they're just sat on the roof of... X-Mansion. X-Mansion. In Westchester, New York. In Westchester, New York. Nice bit of New York, that. Mm. I imagine a mansion out there would have cost a few quid. Well, uh, Char old Charles, old Chucky Xavier, he's, uh, he's, he he's quite few, minted. He, he, he got a big inheritance. Him. Did he? And, yeah, he got big inheritance and he got mind powers. It's like, yeah. All right, yeah, he can't walk, but come on, he's got he's got <laughs> a, he's got a pretty good. He's got he, yeah, he's, he's got enough to make the relevant modification modifications to X Mansion, hasn't he? Yeah, but that moment where they're kind of sat there and they're having a conversation, and Wade sort of admits his feelings, and she says, "Well, you know, I don't really have time for any of that, but we're buds," and that just felt really real. It just felt really real, like two people having a very real, tender moment where they're sort of acknowledging everything between them, but also acknowledging that time isn't right. And that's, you know, that's how human relationships work. Yep. Particularly in the modern day, we're all very fucking busy. Um, and I, ju I just, I, yeah, I really enjoyed that last little passage. I thought it capped off this sort of volume really nicely. Mm. And then had a very interesting, uh, something worse is coming along with the whole T-Ray thing right at the end, yeah. where he's literally musing about the, in a lair yeah kind of yeah about the child murders that he just did yeah like that's pretty dark like normally i've said before that end of an arc leading to a new one is normally the big bad going like suit like watching the hero on a monitor being like ah you don't realize i'm behind everything and soon you will know me but not mm. yet this was like 
T Rose really fucking evil and he hates Deadpool. Like yeah, that totally. was more kind of foreboding than the normal stuff they do. Mm. And this was back in the nineties, so credit to them doing it then. Totally. So yeah, I think that's I think we've covered all points and uh, had some philosophical musings, which is the comic literate brand isn't brand it? pretty much yeah what we're here for so thank you so much for listening um if you'd like to go through our back catalog it's available wherever you get your podcasts from you know some people literally i will see like the downloads on episodes and i'll just have a look like what's on the day like what's you know, mm. the new one's done or whatever um some people are literally just going back and just going through the entire series i've had conversations with people who are absolutely doing that yeah mm. So, well, thank you for doing that, and I hope you're enjoying it, and I hope the fact that you're going through the series means you must be enjoying it somewhat. I had the nicest comment from somebody who's been listening recently when they said, I'm getting through it, I'm really worried I'm going to catch up to the release schedule because then I'll only have one a week. And I was like, that's so heartwarming to hear that we're making, because I think something that I realized about podcasts, particularly the way I consume them, and I think the way that most people consume them is that they're not a lot of podcast listeners aren't necessarily interested in the content mm. it's about having a com- list being like feeling that you're involved in a conversation between two people that you've come to know on a parasocial level through listening to a podcast yeah absolutely and i think there's gotta be i think there's in my experience there's at least gotta be some kind of like i'm into the genre of the thing they're talking about yeah but you don't have to have like people might not have read this deadpool or know anything about it um i've listened to episodes of podcasts where they talk about a thing and i don't know it but i'm like i'll listen to them talk about it and that's why i'd always try and do for more newer stuff or modern stuff stuff that's released this year i really try and hammer home the non-spoilers and spoiler sections yeah. because if you get up to the non-spoiler part and you enjoy the, you think you would enjoy the thing we've talked about trying to give that chance of like if you still want to read it and get you the fullest experience of it mm. stop right now go read it come back like yeah totally kind of but thank you for listening i've had a wonderful time i hope you have too um we are ryan's working on youtube con- on content on the comic stand youtube channel so that's going to be a thing soon it'll be on the comic stand channel yeah which will be but t- there's a thing you can do where another channel will like retweet a video you know i don't know what the youtube expression <laughs> is for it but yeah you'll see it you'll see so it. there's con there's more content coming um there's a whole month of deadpool oh yes we only just so started. if you're into it you've got three more episodes of us read because this week you know it's kind of our first time talking about deadpool we're just getting into it over the next few weeks we are going to become we're going to get real deep we're going through the years of yeah deadpool. So if you were, you know, this, this might be, this could be the most sort of in-depth Deadpool content on the internet for a bit. I would say it's easily going to be the most Deadpool podcast, month of podcasting that any podcast has ever podcasted. And if you want to get in on that podcast, come back next week. We'll see you next week for Thank another you. Deadpool. And I can say right now, exclusively, there will be Deadpool and Cable next week. Amazing. And so come back for that. Big reason for that, which we will get into. So thank you so much for listening and good night. Thank you. Goodbye.